Thank you, Melissa. Uh, it certainly gave us a lot of ideas uh, to think about going forward in this session in particular. Our next speaker today is Chris Lathan. He's a medical oncologist at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, and his research is focusing on the urban and underserved and addressing health disparities. His talk today is bringing oncology specialty care to the community using nursing navigation. Chris? All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm going to try to make sure I press the right button. So, um, you know, I, I think, I hope that you will hear similar themes through different lenses, right? So we're talking about, um, we're talking about equity, we're talking about navigation, we're talking about different systems, and so you're going to hear different themes. What's interesting, and I hope what everybody takes away from this is there, as you heard earlier, there are different ways to do this, and there are different places to get, to get different ways to get to this, but you should see through the different facets where the same, the same things will come up. And I want to just, you know, we're going to do a little background. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of the data we have in our project. I'll explain that to you. And then we'll talk about some of the future considerations. But hopefully, and this is, um, you know, I know uh, Dr. Battaglia talked about earlier the landscape in Boston, which is similar to what's happening in Chicago, right? We have all these great academic uh, medical centers, and yet, you know, Boston, many people forget, Massachusetts is not, but Boston is a majority minority city. And um, although, the, the uh, data in this slide is old. The story hasn't changed, right? You can see that the mortality rates for people of color, specifically for African Americans, are much higher than those who self-identify as, as white. And I think it's, it's interesting, given where we are in Boston, someone ha doesn't have to drive two, three hours to get to a cancer center. And yet there's this issue here, this difference in mortality. You heard specifically about breast cancer, but it's true for all cancers. And so um, somewhere around 2010, 2011, I'm a medical oncologist who treats lung cancer patients. Um, I have long been interested, however, in not just lung cancer, but how do we uh, break down some of those barriers? How do we build bridges to make sure that people have access to all this great care? So um, during this time, and I was very well supported in my institution by Dr. Shulman and also Dr. Benz, uh, to really develop this cancer care equity program. And the goal was really you start thinking a little bit about what's the NCI Cancer Center's job, you know, across two and a half miles, I think it's about two and a half miles from the institution at where I am at Dana-Farber into where Dr. Battaglia is at Boston Medical Center, which is where I trained and did my internal medicine training before I came over. There's only two and a half miles, and yet there's a huge difference. And how, you know, again, that, that bothered me. It, it, it festered with me for some time. And I thought, how can we make sure that we're all trying to work together? And so, you know, we really wanted to, you know, ask these questions. What's the NCI's job, the Cancer Center's job to eliminate cancer disparities? You know, thinking a little bit about there's these disparities research programs, but are they equity-based programs? Are they really doing more than describing disparities over and over again? Because um, Lovell Jones always says, people built empires of, uh, uh, and, and got great academic careers out of describing disparities. But we really want to do more than that. We really wanted to make that step, make that leap into implementation, implementation science. And also redefining the term a little bit. I think that's the point here. This one, right? Yeah, there we go. Um, you know, that we're talking about underrepresented minorities, but also people who speak different languages, the LBGTQ community, lower SES, and rural poor. It's not just about race, as you heard earlier. So I thought it was interesting. Um, you know, one of the things that this is very similar to, this is my iterative, our iterative thought about how you get diagnosed with cancer. And I want you to bear with me for a little bit because it's really important to think about why we did our model and what we did. So the, th the, theory, the theory is, you know, you either have a PCP or you don't. And we're going to talk about people who have a PCP first because actually if you don't have a PCP, it's pretty straightforward. You go to the ED when you have a really bad problem. And in the ED, either you have something that warrants you to stay in the hospital and get worked up or something that they say, well, come back and go see a specialist later. Here's their card. The dotted line are places where people get lost to follow up. So the only time you really get seen immediately is you go to the emergency room with something you know, really urgent. Let's say you're coughing up blood, for example. I'm a lung cancer doctor. And then you'll get a huge workup. And it'll be, you know, they'll make sure it's done fast. The problem is you already have advanced disease. And so what happens if you do have a PCP, right, and you're here? Well, even if you do and you undergo screening, you've seen your, pri your primary care doc sends you into the screening area. Well, as you heard, you could have a different, you know, you have a, you, this dotted line shows you have to come back and get your results. And then you have to decide whether or not if it's abnormal findings, you go to a specialist. These are further places where you can get lose people 
and then get lost to follow up. And it can take a long time for people to get diagnosed with a cancer. And that's when you come in for screening. And if you have non-urgent cancer-related symptoms, weight loss, cough, some of those other things that happen, again, you can get lost in this, for, this iterative process for a long time. And people who have less voice, people who are working every day, people who are poor, they, they have, it's a harder time to continue to come through with this. And you know, the only scenario, again, even with a primary care doc, well, you're going to get a direct workup like this is if you come in with something that every doc knows this is bad, you got to go to the emergency room, and then you'll get that workup. But unfortunately, it's a lot of times it's too late. So um, as we thought about this program, the goal was to maximize uh, overall research, but more, more importantly, the, the clinical aspect of disparities. And uh, we were lucky enough to have a lot of support. And we had, like a lot of these programs in the beginning, you start off with philanthropic funding. And we really were lucky to have a great gift. And um, also some people who came back and gave more. So um, I don't want to take you through too much of the, you know, the, the theory of it. But basically, the, the goal was really to, to create a community-based uh, research program and also a pilot program for streamlined access to cancer centered for newly diagnosed patients. And that's really what we're going to talk about most. We're interested in clinical trial accrual, but we all, and we also wanted to find some equity and quality metrics. Um, and we really wanted to think, you know, on a larger level about Dana Farber, how we're going to unite our disparities efforts. So this is our model. I'm sorry that it's small, but I'll take you through it. Generally, the thought that this, the whole point of this is to build it around the nurse navigator. Um, and I, you know, when we, when, when we thought about this program back in 2010, what I did is I looked at all the different cancer centers and I looked at their, their current outreach programs for uh, disparities. And the majority of them actually had research programs but didn't have outreach programs. And the few that did have outreach programs, they were in one or two diseases, usually either breast, right, or prostate cancer because that's where some of the funding was. There was not a holistic program. And the other thing I thought was, you know, as a medical oncologist, the time I get called in is after tissue diagnosis, right? I don't really, don't call me until you already made your diagnosis. Um, and I don't, I'm not sure if that paradigm is what we really want, especially as we think about working with our colleagues in federally qualified health centers or in the community. Perhaps medical oncology could be much more helpful than just waiting for the diagnosis. So the idea, whoops, I see you go back, probably this button, yes. All right, so uh, the idea was, you know, we embed ourselves in the primary care center. In this case, it's a federally qualified health center. Uh, just, it's one of the health centers that actually was listed in uh, Dr. Battaglia's slide as well, about two miles away from us. Um, and, you know, the, at this case, you know, the idea is that the primary care providers would refer to our uh, nurse navigator, any person who had an oncology-related question. And to be very clear about that, that to me meant anything that the primary care doc wanted, had a question about. You didn't have to have a cancer diagnosis. You just had to have a question that your primary care doc needed help with. Maybe it's a low white count. Maybe it's weight loss and it seems fishy, right? Something's not right with this patient. I wanted to make sure that the referral process was broad for us because what then happens, and then those referrals would come in into our program nurse, and we'll talk a little bit about her later on because she's the key. And then she and I would triage the patients, and then we would actually have, we would actually see patients in the clinic. I'll go back again. I'm getting a little too happy with the button. There you go. Um, so, so um, and it's folks who would come in not only just for, you know, diagnostic evaluations, but reestablishing uh, connection with oncology with a lot of people who get diagnosed in the Dominican and they'd say, I got cancer down there and they come to see us and we're like, what kind of cancer? I don't know. Okay. Um, and literally there were times where I had to ask people, did you sit in a chair? Did you get chemotherapy? How long were you sitting in a chair for? So I can get an idea of what regimen might be used before we actually were able to get the records because people sometimes, you know, we think everybody knows exactly what they're, what they're getting, but the truth is it's very complicated. And um, it takes a little while for those records to come back, and I had to kind of figure that out and do some detective work because I want to know what is their surveillance program for survivorship. You know, and all of these questions might not necessarily get you into the cancer center, right? It's, these are things that, you know, your, your primary care doc wants to know, though. And then also there's some, you know, abnormal, any abnormal screenings. And so because we were there, right, and we did a lot of community-level educational sessions, so we would do, do talks and education about clinical trials, about... Uh, low white counts and low platelets, all those things, but, you know, to really make some connections with the providers there. And we, our thought was we we're doing formal and informal provider consultations. We do these lunch sessions where we go over cases. And again, the whole thing is to provide comfort. Um, and then at that point, our, you know, when the patient came to see us in clinic and our integrated evaluation service, really the key here is our, you know, nurse navigator. Um, we had a separate patient navigator. So when we started, we had the nurse navigator and the thought was, our, our program nurse is going to get too busy. She's setting up the clinic. She's triaging. And then there's some, a lot of individual navigation work, right, with helping with transportation and doing all these other things. The nurse is going to be too busy. We need her to work up to our license. Well, two things happened. 
One, um, our volume did go up a little bit, but what happened is the patient navigator ended up, because of the complexity, complexity of the work, our program nurse, it, it ended up being very difficult for her to add more to this. It was actually stayed in nursing. So we had our patient navigator, separate lay navigator for about two years, but then afterwards we transitioned and we just kept with, the, with our program nurse doing the navigation. So we had tried that way. We thought it would, it would happen that way, but I don't know if it's, a, if it's the nature of our program nurse, who, by the way, Dr. Shulman continues to try to steal from us. <laughs> you can only have part of her, okay? Um, and then, you know, as far as the oncology providers, there were, in the beginning there were five, under, uh, five other medical oncologists and we would all act as generalists there. I want to be very clear. So when I went there, I wasn't being a lung cancer doctor. I was actually seeing whatever issue that came up. Um, and the idea is we keep as much in the health center as possible. We operate under the health center's license. So these aren't revenue, there's no revenue that's coming back to the cancer center. All about, you know, staying in, in kind of helping the individual federally qualified health center. Now, if the person did need something else, they had an active cancer-related issue, then they did get navigated to the cancer center for whatever they need, surgical biopsies, imaging, palliative care, whatever needed to be done. Everybody with me so far? All right. So what do we see? So this is um, over about a five-year period. And I want to say this is one, as opposed to other things you've heard before, this is really one specific health center, right? So this is not a multitude of health centers. So we're not talking about tons and tons of numbers. but over the few years that we've been doing this, uh, it's been about five and a half years now. There are about 736 visits, 431 new patients. And what people told me in the beginning is, Chris, you're only going to see benign heme. Your oncologists are going to get bored. Why do we need an oncologist there? Why do we need an oncology nurse? Uh, to, our, our nurse navigator is a full, she actually left the infusion room to take this job. She took a pay cut and she left the infusion room nursing to do this. She had done other work. Uh, in, in, you know, in Nicaragua and other places, and she had been a nurse manager in other places, but she was dedicated to this. And to her, this is exactly the job she wanted to do. She's multilingual, and she just, she really wanted to do it. So to me, there was passion there for the right people. And the truth was, we didn't just see benign heme. As a matter of fact, about 42% of the people, did, you know, had some sort of hematologic or oncologic issue. And 58% were, you're going to see screening issues that came up later on. So, you know, it wasn't just about benign hematology. And then if you look at the reasons for referral, the number one was evaluate for cancer. Number two was hematological consult. So that was there. This is what came up that surprised us genetic counseling and testing. The primary care docs were sending people to us and they said, this person has a family history of cancer you don't know what to do with. So what we did is we went back to, um, we had a very robust program at the Dana-Farber and we had our genetic counselor and the medical uh, uh, geneticist come out quarterly to uh, the Federally Qualified Health Center to do these evaluations. And this continues to go on. We actually just got a paper uh, published talking about what they're seeing, some of the differences between doing this sort of testing at a federally qualified health center versus doing it at, our, at, at the main campus. Um, then the other thing we implemented was a lung cancer screening program. You heard earlier uh, Dr. O talking a little bit about this, about you know, how do we do this? How do we do this underserved patient populations? This patient population is 70% African American, 65% are on some sort of either Medicaid or managed Medicaid program, and about 30% speak Spanish because it's a large Dominican population there. So this is an uh, underserved patient population for sure, and one of the things that we wanted to do was implement a screening program, and that's been going on for about three and a half years. Um, and then, of course, there were some people who came in for the follow-up care for cancer, and a very small percentage who came in for some sort of active cancer treatment. Um, and if you look at the cancer diagnoses, as I mentioned, you know, a lot of these folks were screening-based. Uh, about 20% were hematologic-based, and these are the people who came in for the oncology visits, right? Uh, about 21% were straight oncology. Um, where did they go? Well, this is what we wanted to see. A lot of people stayed in their own system, right? They just needed a little extra help. They just needed us to know somebody else was managing them, that we'd see them again in the clinic later on. We had wanted to monitor that white count. It's really benign uh, leukopenia. It really doesn't require you to go to see a hematologist. You know, those sort of things we keep in. And yet the people who needed to come out, who really needed to be there, those are the folks who went to Dana-Farber or to the Brigham, needed imaging, scans, biopsies, et cetera. Um, and then specifically for those who really care, like what do we really see? Well, a lot of hematology, those, that's the referral center is, uh, the disease center is referred to. Um, prostate cancer, not surprising. Genetics. Um, what was surprising is that we didn't, you say, well, where's all the breast? We're hearing all about breast. Well, we have a separate program for breast, as often happens, right? And they actually go through a whole different system, so they don't usually come through our clinic. There's a, a, a mammo, uh, mammography suite that's there. It's directly connected to the rest of our program. So the breast cancer patients, actually, we would have slowed them down if we had them come to see our clinic, which is why we don't see as many of them. What we usually see, actually, is people who come in with 
they didn't have a mammo, they might have a lump, there's something going on with the breast, and we sent them over either to, uh, a mammo to mammography or over to our, our abnormal breast uh, clinic. So just to give you an idea that you heard a little bit, <clears throat> you know, these are the types of resolutions that we have. And I'll tell you a little bit about our database in a second. <clears throat> uh, about 35% of patients are referred to the primary care doctor. Most of the time, we're establishing a surveillance plan. And a smaller percentage, especially for the folks who don't have a cancer diagnosis, have some sort of treatment plan established, and a higher percentage of folks who have cancer. Um, and then what did we do, and what have we seen? So what, what's been interesting is that uh, the primary care docs have been very interested in this. In the beginning, in particular, we sat down and we implemented this program with them. So we didn't just come in and implement this. We said, what do you need? How, would, how does it need to be done? We actually published this separately from the model itself, but how we integrated it and how we implemented it. It was a very, it was educational for me. I came in with some ideas. This is what we're going to do. And then I found, actually, maybe this isn't what they want. And then we augmented what we wanted to what, what they want as we worked together. Um, and then what we found is that the, you know, the patients love it. The physicians really liked it. And then this was the incidental finding. So when we went back and we have this data uh, cohort that we have all on REDCap database, so we collect the navigation information and the intake information for future studies, 15% of all patients with a cancer diagnosis were on a clinical trial afterwards. And I repeat, this, these are mostly African-American and Latino patients, so that's a pretty good number. It should be higher, but that's pretty darn good. And then if you really look at people who have active treatment. Some of these people, right, they don't have an active cancer, so they wouldn't be on clinical trial. So people who are in active treatment, it was, it was almost 25%. So this tells me that, you know, one of the things, just the familiarity of what we do, the education that we're doing, it makes a difference if people get diagnosed. And as I mentioned, we put this clinical patient cohort together with IRB approval so we can go back and do studies. And we've done some qualitative research studies. We won't talk about that today. And we have a separate uh, patient navigation database that tracks all those different things that you heard about today that the navigators do. And so, you know, some of the outcomes of interest specifically, and you heard earlier today, I think, with uh, Dr. Paskett speaking, talking a little bit about the days to resolution. That's really the metric we wanted to use. And if you looked at all patients, right, when we first got started, uh, the median time to resolution was around 19 days, and the mean was 33. Um, for the oncology patients, actually, the mean was 30 days, and the median was 12.5 days. And when you compare it to from when we were there, before we were there, the median time for cancer diagnosis days to resolution was 32 days. So we're pretty pleased about that. A lot of issues with this is not exactly apples to, to oranges and, excuse me, not exactly apples to apples. It's really the metrics. We didn't have as many metrics in the beginning. What We had to take the data that we had at the data center. And, you know, reviewers don't like that sort of thing. But the truth is, you know, you know we were very pleased with that because we were looking to try to get that median time under two weeks. So um, I wanted to just end with a couple of things that we were doing and some of the, you know, the studies that we're looking at, specifically continuing the lung cancer theme, um, we have some data on uh, smoking cessation and lung cancer screening. And the upshot of this is basically that patients are actually very interested in lung cancer screening. We have very few people no show for that. It's usually under, it's like 20, 25 percent no show rate. Um, uh, but once, and they will actually say they want to do a tobacco cessation. So we ask them verbally. We have an on site tobacco cessation counselor. Everybody's interested. And then we schedule it at the time that they want. And then they don't show up for the tobacco cessation. They certainly show up for the lung cancer screening. And then when they come back next year, we do it all over again. So we still have these opportunities to help them. But as I've talked to other people who have lung cancer screening programs in, in areas like this, this is a similar issue. The idea that people will say yes to tobacco cessation. We have an on-site counselor, right? You don't have to call a quit line. We do all the things that we think would be great, and people still no-show at a 65% rate. So we still have some issues here, and I think this is, we talk about expanding lung cancer screening. This is one of the things we have to make sure that tobacco cessation works for them in whatever way that we can do it. Um, and then this part is really, um, this is financial stress. This is continuing some of the separate work that we've done looking at the idea of, you know, there are people, there's this idea that, you know, obviously if you're diagnosed with cancer, cancer makes you poor. But beyond that, right, what if you're already poor when you have a cancer diagnosis? And there's some people who have actually financial distress at the time of their diagnosis. And some of the other work that we've shown, and it, separate from this, it showed that if you actually have financial stress at the time of your diagnosis, your quality of life, separate from your cancer and your cancer staging is lower. You're actually more likely to experience symptoms and exp express your symptoms as worse than people who didn't have financial distress. And you know, some of the preliminary exploratory work said folks could be presenting with later stage disease. This is just by asking a simple question on, you know, about financial distress that's easily answered. Like, are you having difficulty paying your monthly bills? Or another question that people ask is, how long could you live without, you know, without any salary support off your savings? Right. So um, what we did is we took that data and we looked at this particular patient population. And, and again, the upshot of this is really, you know, that 
most of the people, the same thing, it's a quality of life was affected by whether or not they had uh, financial distress. Not surprisingly, folks had more financial distress if they were younger, unemployed, um, had less than a bachelor's degree, and were insured by Medicaid. Um, and they were more likely to relate their quality of life as lower uh, compared to those without financial distress. Race, gender, and presence of a cancer diagnosis and comorbidities were not associated with financial distress, which is kind of interesting if you really think about it, right? And so one of the things that we found here is that this is consistent with what we found in a larger CanCORS database, even looking at a, a, a very uh, vulnerable patient population. Um, and just in summary, just in the last couple slides, you know, we really have, this is an integrated service model from diagnosis, treatment, survivorship, and eventually to end of life care. Um, and, you know, we really, the goal and the kind of the, the fulcrum of this is to streamline diagnostic services, the fact that we're co-located in a community health center, um, and we're trying to tailor to the needs of the community health center. And we're also, you know, it really interested in prevention and screening. Um, you know, we think the model can be used in many different settings, increases the flow of the patients to a cancer center, strengthens the bonds in the community, and also allows for the integration of preventative medicine programs. And, you know, these are all programs that came up from the need of the providers, genetics, lung cancer screening, and uh, the dentist came to us, they have a dental program there, and they said, you know, basically we need to kind of, if we see something odd and we want a biopsy, how do we get to oral surgeons? And so we set up that pathway as well. Um, challenges. This isn't all cake, right? This is not easy. So I want to tell you that it's all been in roses and, and happiness and unicorns. Um, the truth is, you know, it's, it's you know, the, the, there's competition. And the competition, I think you heard this a little bit, and we're trying to get over this. I think it's been great to hear, uh, the, you know, if you talk about, if you look at Dr. Battaglia and Karen Freund and, you know, and uh, Jennifer Haas, and that group has done is really said, let's break down this academic issue. My patient, your patient, this goes here. What are you doing on my turf? Let's figure out what's best for the patient and let's let's figure out how we can use our individual strengths and I think that that's been one of the things that we've we found that's been difficult um, and also the work tends to be personality driven so if the people who are really interested in this leave who takes it up if it's not institutionalized if it's not put into the operational budget then what happens then the program drops if you don't have your philanthropic sponsor then what happens I promise I'm almost done. I know I'm over in about a minute. So um, there's some other issues for the, the wonks in the room. It's a small sample size. I understand that. Sustainability is an issue, but I will tell you this. Our institution has really decided to, uh, to incorporate our program nurse, and uh, we're going to have a nurse practitioner that's going to run this model, uh, something that Larry told me I should do a long time ago. We finally got that happening. And uh, that's going to be part of the operational budget. So it can be sustainable without just, you know, we can still write grants to do our research, but certainly the clinic side can still be sustainable without that. Um, and I'll skip that and just say this is the staff, and this is the key right here. Ludmila is, um, she speaks five languages. I'm not exaggerating. Um, she is the, the fulcrum by which it all turns around, and she's been fantastic. And without her, the program would not work. Um, and then uh, the docs are here, and we, we're helpful. But certainly, certainly, I think it's, it's really been uh, her effectiveness and her willingness to be in the community. Uh, Rebecca does some separate uh, tobacco education work for her, and uh, Audrey makes it all work for us. So thank you very much for your time and attention.